Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. Hi, this is Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of Open Your Eyes, and today we have a very special guest, Dr. Tom O'Brien, who's an expert in autoimmune disease. He uh, was the host of Betrayal, which was a docu-series, which I watched every episode, which I thought was fantastic. He, is the, he has a website called thedoctor.com, and he wrote this incredible book called The Autoimmune Fix. He's able to make very difficult concepts very easy. And I really appreciate listening to him and learning from him. He teaches doctors all over the world about his philosophy and about autoimmune disease. So I want to start off with a case that I, that I had uh, recently, which was a 12-year-old girl who had an autoimmune disease called uveitis, which is an inflammation inside the eye which could cause a lot of damage inside the eye. So we have to treat the symptoms. We have to treat it medically with steroids and dilating the pupil and get uh, even uveitis specialists sometimes involved. But what is not treated is the cause. So 80% of the time, children with autoimmune disease have something called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And this child didn't have that. So you're an expert. You're a super sleuth. It's like the, like, uh, like the movie, who are you going to call Ghostbusters, but we call Tom. <laughs> so Tom, can you tell us a little bit about tests to help diagnose these autoimmune diseases eight, seven, eight years ahead of t schedule? Sure, sure. And it varies with the autoimmune disease. It, it's actually as long as 20 years ahead of time. If you find uh, elevated antibodies to the uh, gallbladder, for example, you can tell that patient with uh, quite a bit of assurance, they're called uh, uh, PBH antibodies, that in 20 years, they're going to have this devastating disease. And doctors used to not talk about that kind of thing with people. It's like saying you've got the gene for Alzheimer's, and they used to not talk about that or test for it because it just worries the patient. But now we know that it gives you a window of opportunity to address the mechanism that's causing that autoimmune condition, whatever the condition is. Alzheimer's is autoimmune. So in the example that you gave with uveitis, so that child's immune system is producing antibodies attacking the nerves and the tissue around the eye. So the question is, of course, you wanna give steroids if necessary to calm down that inflammation, but you have to ask the question, why is the immune system attacking the nerves of the eyes? Why? And I'll give you one example. It's a very common example, unfortunately. One of the components of the nerves of not just the eyes, but especially of the eyes, is called aquaporin-4. It's like a building block in making the nerves. You know, you build a house, you've got bricks and mortar and drywall and um, uh, tubing for the electrical wires to go through. There's lots of components. Well, the same is true for our bodies. And in the nerves to the eyes, one of the components is called aquaporin-4. Now, when you read the science, you see that if someone has a food sensitivity to corn, soy, tomato, or spinach, and they're making antibodies to fight corn, soy, tomato, or spinach, those antibodies attacking the tomato in your bloodstream can attack the aquaporin-4 uh, component of the nerves of your eyes. And if those antibodies to the food attack your eyes, you kill off that part of the cell. And when you kill off a cell or damage a cell, your immune system 
cleans up all the garbage, all of the old cells and the damaged cells. Your immune system cleans them up by making antibodies to aquaporin-4 in this example. So if you have a sensitivity to a food, your immune system trying to protect you attacks the food molecules in your bloodstream. But if you have the genetics for this particular condition, it's called molecular mimicry, that the antibodies to the food attacks the tissue that kind of mimics or looks a little like the food, and that's the aquaporin-4. And so the antibodies attack aquaporin-4. When you attack aquaporin-4, you damage that nerve cell. And Mrs. Patient, you have an entire new body every seven years. Every cell in your body regenerates, except your teeth, every other cell. Bone cells, brain cells, nerve cells, heart cells, muscle cells, they all, they all regenerate. You make new cells. Some are really fast, like the inside of your guts every three to five days. Some are really slow. But nerve cells are a little bit on the slower side. But you still regenerate new nerve cells. How does that happen? Your immune system's got to get rid of the old and damaged cells to make room for the new cells. That's why you have a normal level of antibodies to aquaporin-4 in this example, or a normal level of antibodies to myelin, uh, the, the coating around your nerves. There's a normal reference range. You get a blood test, you look for antibodies to myelin, you're within the normal range, don't worry about it. It means that you're making as many cells as you're losing. So the antibodies are getting rid of the old cells, but you're making enough of the new cells that you're in the normal range. But when you have a food sensitivity, in this example for the eyes, corn, soy, tomato, or spinach, and you make antibodies to those, they can attack the aquaporin-4. Now you're, you're damaging more cells than just to make new cells in regeneration, the normal pace. You're damaging more cells, so you get elevated antibodies to aquaporin-4. Now you start the mechanism of an autoimmune condition. And, and you kill off a few cells, you kill off a few too many cells, a few more, a few more. You can't tell until somewhere down the road, depending on the condition, somewhere between six months to 20 years later, you've got the autoimmune disease. Uveitis, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, it doesn't matter. What the, that's why this book explains all of that in detail. So that, and it's done in everyday language, you know, so that you can really get a sense, oh, wait a minute, I've, I've been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and I feel terrible. All right, I'm gonna take the meds, but all right, why do I have this condition? What can I do to stop the mechanism besides suppressing the pain Suppressing the pain is a really good idea, really good idea. You have to be able to function. Or your child's eyes. You take prednisone because um, your child's been diagnosed with uveitis, of, of course, because you don't want to damage the eyes any further. But prednisone stunts growth. It shortens lifespans. It's not good. If you need it, you take it. But the goal here is to eliminate the need for the prednisone. And how do you do that? By calming down the inflammation. How do you do that? by finding out what's the trigger causing the inflammation. How do you do that? You read the book <laughs> because it can be foods. It can be mold in your house if you've got a smelly basement. You know, Mrs. Patient, when you go on vacation, when you come home, do you have to open the windows to air the house out? Oh, yeah. You got mold in your house. Check it out. Have, it, have the house tested for mold because you're breathing it all day long and it gets right up into your brain and causes inflammation in your brain. And it's one of the contributors to the development of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. Just read the science. It's really clear. So it's a long answer. No. But the summary is food sensitivities with uveitis is a very common thing that just must be checked for. You just have to check. And what is that test from Cyrex number five? How does it test for different types of, as a predictor of disease? There's a couple of laboratories that have come up with the types of tests that are really helpful for doctors to figure out what's going on with you or what's cooking in the background that you may not even know about yet. One of those tests is the one you refer to from Cyrex Labs. It's called Array Number 5 or 
test number five, and I actually helped put that test together um, uh, back in 2010. And it looks at um, six different tissues to your brain, three to your heart, two to your thyroid, your lungs, your liver, your bones, your muscles, your, repro your digestive system, your reproductive system. So you do a blood draw, and we look at 24 different tissues to see, do you have elevated antibodies to any of your own tissue? And if you do, you're on the autoimmune spectrum. Now, what's a spectrum? An autoimmune spectrum means that your immune system is making too many antibodies, killing off more cells than you're regenerating, and you're going into a deficit. And you can't feel when you've got elevated antibodies to your brain. This is how I got into all of this. 1997, uh, Dr. Aristo Vajdani, the creator of the test that you referred to, I met him in a uh, seminar that I was at. And we talked for two and a half hours. And so I did his test, his research test, this 24 tissue thing, it was research only back then. And I had three elevated antibodies to my brain. Myelin basic protein, that's the saran wrap around your nerves. When you kill off the myelin, that's MS. Cerebellar peptides, and when you kill off too much cerebellar tissue, you can't walk very well anymore. That's why elders can't dance up and down the stairs. They have to hold the railing. It's not because their leg muscles can't do it, but their brain is not registering through the nerves what's going on. Uh, where are your feet touching? What's the angle of the ground and all that? And uh, gangliosides was the third one. Um, that causes brain shrinkage overall in a uh, dementia that's a little different than Alzheimer's. I had all three of these elevated. I was 44. I was in the peak of my physical health. I was doing triathlons regularly, scoring at 44, scoring the top 10% of the 30 to 35-year-olds. So I was walking tall. You know, I'm a stud. I'm st I've still got it at 44, right? And so this blood test comes back and it says, I've got these antibodies elevated. And I said, I called the lab. I said, what is this? This is a mistake. And they said, no, it's not. They said, do it. I said, do it again. They said, we did. We know it's you. We did it again. Sorry. It was correct. And that's when I learned I had three antibodies elevated, killing off my brain, different sections of my brain. So for the child that you talked about, the 12 year old, for a few years, most likely, this child has had antibodies attacking the nerves of the eyes. So the question, and finally, there's so much tissue that is damaged, now they're starting to get symptoms from it. It's not the first day they have symptoms, they say, mommy, my eyes hurt, or I can't see very well. That's not when it began. The spectrum began years earlier. Maybe it's tomatoes, maybe it's spinach, maybe it's corn, maybe it's wheat. You don't know. You just have to ex investigate to find out why is this happening? Where is it coming from? Ex explain why there are so many more people getting autoimmune disease, what autoimmune disease is, and how many people have it, what the epidemiology is of it. Yeah. Autoimmune disease is when, uh, uh, well, there, it's when your immune system, you know, your Mrs. Patient, your immune system is the armed forces in your body. It's there to protect you. There's an army, a navy, an air force, a marines, a coast guard. We call them IGA, IgG, IgE, IgM. They're just different branches of the armed forces there to protect you. So when you have an autoimmune condition, it means that your armed forces have been called out and they're attacking your thyroid or they're attacking your bones, or they're attacking your muscles, or they're attacking your brain, or they're attacking your eyes. It just depends, but the mechanism is very similar. So the question is, why is my immune system attacking my thyroid? We'll use that one as the example. Many people have heard of this toxic chemical called bisphenol A, or BPA. 
And it's, it's a, a phthalate, that's a category of chemicals used to mold plastic. And when you drink water out of plastic water bottles, there's BPA in it. You're getting BPA. So BPA, when it gets into your bloodstream, it has a tendency to grab on to different proteins and stay there. And one of the proteins it grabs onto is your thyroid. Just Google BPA, the three letters, Baker, Paul, Andrew, BPA, and thyroid. Just Google that. Here come the studies. And you go, oh my goodness, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So that's an example of a chemical that binds with your thyroid and it can trigger your immune system to attack your thyroid because all this toxic sludge is on your thyroid now. And your immune system trying to protect you says, we got to get rid of that junk so the thyroid can work more normally again. Just read the science. It's, it's, there are so many studies on this now. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm answering your question. Arguably, the number one journal, medical journal, in the English language for healthcare for children is the journal Pediatrics. It's put out by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And they published a policy statement in the journal. Now you have to understand, when a policy statement is published, it's not some author that has a good idea and writes it up and gets it published in the journal. This is the board of the American Academy of Pediatrics that agreed, we have to publish a policy statement. And what they said was that the Toxic Substance Control Act, which is our federal guidelines controlling all the chemicals that we're exposed to, they said the TSCA, the Toxic Substance Control Act, has failed miserably in protecting our children and the adults, but children. And what it comes down to is that the regulations are so cumbersome and so uh, I'm not quite sure what nice word to use. The lobbyists um, spent millions of dollars and paid off our senators and our House of Representatives to pass this legislation that has no teeth. There's no teeth. And the result is, and people don't believe this, just check for yourself, Toxic Substance Control Act. And it's 1976, but it's still the regulating guidelines for chemicals introduced into our world. And in, since in 40 years, they have regulated five chemicals or classes of chemicals in 40 years. And there are thousands that come out every year, new chemicals. And they said in the policy statement of the, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, it's 247 pounds of chemicals manufactured or imported into the United States, 247 pounds per person per day, every day. That means for you and I, Doc, that's 500 pounds. That's 10 50 pound bags every single day. And what does all that mean? We now know every newborn child in America has at least 280 chemicals in their bloodstream that aren't supposed to be there at birth. They're not supposed to be there, but they were in mom, and so they went through to baby. Let me give you one example of the effects of this, of where this 12-year-old's uveitis may have come from. 346 pregnant women in Chicago, they measured their urine and they measured phthalates, the chemicals that mold plastic. They measured five different phthalates, there are many. They just measured five, one of them was BPA. And they categorized them into quartiles, the lowest, the next one, the third, and the highest quartile. They then followed these children of the pregnant moms after they were born, and when the children turned seven years old, they did Wexler IQ tests on them. That's the official IQ test. Now, there's not much in medicine that's an all or every, but this was every. It's really unusual. Every child whose mother was in the highest quartile of phthalates and urine during pregnancy compared to the 
children whose mothers were in the lowest quartile of phthalates of urine in pregnancy, everyone in the highest quartile, their IQ was seven points lower than the kids in the lowest quartile of phthalates in urine in pregnancy. Now, seven points doesn't mean anything to anybody until you learn that a one point difference is noticeable, but a seven point difference is the difference between a child working really hard getting straight A's and a child working really hard getting straight C's. This kid doesn't have the brain. It never developed properly. Because if you type into Google phthalates and neurogenesis, brain growth, phthalates inhibit brain growth. So moms in pregnancy, if they had high levels of phthalates, their baby's brain never developed the way it's supposed to. They're seven points lower IQ. So where do you get phthalates? Plastic storage containers. What do you put your leftover chicken in? Or your leftover soup? The next day, that chicken will have phthalates in it. Or the next day, that chicken or that, that, contain, that um, soup will have phthalates in it. Phthalates leach into the food. Plastic wrap around food leaches phthalates into the food. Oh my God, we've always used phthalates. Well, yeah, and you've always had this problem, but now it's getting worse because it's 247 pounds of chemicals per person per day that are being dumped into the US. That's why autoimmune diseases are going through the roof. That's why autism, children's brains, autism is going through the roof. That's why just this year, well, we're in 2020 now, last year, the Alzheimer's Association came out and said one in every three elders dies with Alzheimer's or another dementia. One out of three. Your brain is the yellow canary in the coal mine. And most people know a yellow canary was used, miners would take a canary in a bird cage down into the coal mine, and while they were working, they looked over there every once in a while, made sure the bird was still sitting in this little swing. But if they looked and the bird dropped, they got out of there really quick because methane gas leaches and you can't smell it, but the birds, it'll kill the bird. So the yellow canary in the coal mine saved thousands of miners' lives. The yellow canary in the coal mine for our world today, our environment, is our brains. And our brains are going down really quick and we're scared to death and we don't know what to do. That's why everyone needs to read my second book. Because this one talks about where is all this stuff coming from? Why is there so much inflammation in the brain? Why is a 12-year-old got so much activated immune system attacking the nerves coming from the brain? Where's it coming from? And as you learn all this, you go, oh my God, oh my God, this is, a, what, Tupperware containers? What, what, nail polish leaches phthalates into my bloodstream? What, what am I gonna do? You go back to the book. Now look at the subtitle. Just one hour a week to the best memory, productivity, and sleep you've ever had. Now that's not just a cutesy title, it's the only way to be successful at this. So every Tuesday night after dinner, every Sunday morning after services, whenever it is, but you tell your family every week, I'm allocating one hour, and I'm gonna learn how to make us healthier, how to help create an environment so we get healthier. And one week you go back to the book, say, all right, I'm dealing with Tupperware this week. And you go back to the book and you find the three links that I give you and you go online and you look for glass storage containers and oh those are nice oh I really like those and you order three round ones and some square ones and one for the pie and you give your credit card and you hit send it took you an hour but that's it you're done for the week but never again will you poison your family by putting leftover foods in plastic storage containers. Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. Thank you for tuning in to the Open Your Eyes podcast. If you like the video you're watching, please hit the like button. Also hit subscribe for weekly new episodes of the podcast along with pod winks and bonus content. All right, let's get back to the show.
what do you personal what do you personally do? Do you use infrared sauna? Do you use yeah. green juice? Do you obviously use glass? What do you do for your water? What do you do to clean your air in your home? What are some things you personally do for the chemicals? You, it, it, it depends on where you live and what kind of environment you're in and what kind of conditions you're dealing with. That's why I teach so many docs about the functional medicine principle. You have to see what the individual needs. But unfortunately, because of the world we live in today, Everyone needs an air filtration system in their house. Everyone needs a water filtration system in their house. The healthiest water you can drink is your tap water after it's gone through filtration. You re Critically important. Reverse osmosis or any specific type of filtration you recommend? Reverse osmosis, two micron filter, charcoal granulation. That's the basics of it. And then it just depends on your budget as to what you can afford. Any filter is better than no filter. Anything is. You know, but you just have to learn this stuff and it's so overwhelming. You can't learn all of it in one hour or in one, one um, series. Uh, that's why you get the series and you listen to it again and again. That's why we've had over 600,000 people listen to uh, Betrayal. And many of them said, I need to hear this again or I need to have my son listen to this. You know, and they buy the program for 97 bucks. And because you listen to one world leader and if it changes your life, I mean, is it not worth it? Of course it is. So, but the message is there's so much to learn and it's overwhelming to try to learn it all at once. You just allocate one hour a week to this. And in six months, you've got this. That's the way you do it. So you listen to this summit and you listen to it again. You listen to betrayal. You read the book, some of the other experts on this summit, you follow them on their websites, you know, just see what calls to you that you want to learn about, and you just start learning. Uh, unfortunately, you can't not take action anymore. One out of three dies with dementia if you don't take action. That's the current statistic. You One out the, of three. You did the gluten summit, which was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. It was really great. Now, if you could, if you could talk about the problems with gluten and non-celiac gluten sensitivity and celiac. Sure. I'm going to rock your world again a little bit. Uh, uh, when, when you read the science, it's really clear. Wheat and gluten, which is in wheat and rye and barley, gluten is toxic to humans, but it's a minor toxin. It's not a big deal. Not a big deal at all. But, and that's why everyone doesn't have to give up wheat. You don't have to. Every human, though, does get, um, you, you've heard of leaky gut. They get transient intestinal permeability every time they eat wheat. Within five minutes of wheat coming out of the stomach into the intestines, you tear the lining of your gut. That's called transient intestinal permeability. But the fastest growing cells in the body, remember we regenerate a whole new body every seven years, the fastest growing cells are the inside lining of the gut. Every two, three days you have a new lining to the gut depending on what study you read. So you eat toast for breakfast, you tear the lining and it heals. You have a sandwich for lunch, you tear the lining, it heals. You have pasta for dinner, you tear the lining, but it heals. Day after week after month after year until one day, you don't heal anymore. Now you've got the leaky gut, pathogenic intestinal permeability. Technically, that's called loss of oral tolerance. You don't tolerate this minor irritant anymore. And when you don't tolerate wheat anymore, now you've got a problem because now your immune system gets called up trying to protect you and these antibodies get produced to wheat and depending on your genetics, the antibodies will attack your brain, attack your thyroid, attack your lungs, your liver. It just depends on your genetics. So wheat is a minor trigger until you cross the line of tolerance, which can occur at two years old, 22 years old, 92 years old, just depends on when you cross the threshold. So the question is, what triggers crossing the threshold that now I'm gonna be sensitive to wheat? It's all the chemicals we're exposed to that your grandparents were never exposed to. Your parents, when they were your age, were never exposed to this amount of chemicals that we have now. 
like never the before in, in our film. Yeah, like great. The centenarians in our film. Great. Never before in history have humans been exposed to this amount of toxins, and we don't have any protection against it. We don't have any protection. Our immune systems designed to protect us are the exact the same, same immune systems as your ancestors thousands of years ago. And what did our ancestors have to fight? Bugs, parasites, viruses, mold, fungus, and bacteria. That's it. There is no immune response to phthalates. There's no immune response to lead, lead poisoning, like Flint, Michigan, in the water, and so many other cities in the country. There's no immune response for red dye number three. There's no immune response for any of the chemicals we're exposed to. Your immune response can only respond to bugs, parasites, viruses, mold, fungus, or bacteria. So when you're exposed to phthalates, your immune system gets activated to fight a bug, parasite, virus, mold, fungus, or bacteria. That's all it can do. Wheat triggers the immune response. Technically, it's called toll-like receptor 4. That's the geeky term for it. But wheat activates the immune response to fight bacteria. Your body thinks you just drank some bad water and you got bad bugs in you that might kill you. And so the immune system gets activated when you cross that line of tolerance to fight wheat. That's the immune response. That's the science when you read it. But that doesn't happen to everyone until you cross tolerance. Now, when you cross that tolerance and you get the leaky gut, that, by the way, and that's in this book, that- Which is a great book, by the way, because I read it. That leaky gut is the gateway in the development of autoimmune diseases. Which autoimmune disease? Rheumatoid, MS, psoriasis, lupus, uh, dermatitis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, the list goes on and on and on. Just Google Alzheimer's and leaky gut. Just Google rheumatoid arthritis and leaky gut. Just Google MS and leaky gut. Here are the studies. And our doctors have never been trained in this. You know, they don't, they're, they're not familiar with this. So it sounds like, no, it can't be that simple. Yes, it can be. What are some early symptoms of non-celiac gluten sensitivity? It just, it depends on your genes. If you've got the genes where your, the nerves of your eyes are going to be affected, you get blurry eyes every once in a while. If you've got the genes where it's your brain, you get a little brain fog. You eat pasta and you get a little brain fog. Where, where are my keys? Where are my keys? Or where did I park my car? What, where, which parking lot is it in? You know, any of that kind of stuff. The symptoms just of any symptoms in the body, you, they may be caused by inflammation created from a food sensitivity. So uh, let's talk about the microbiome. Uh, is having more uh, different bacteria better or less bacteria better? And how can we improve it? Oh, my goodness. Um, as you read more about this in either one of my books, I talked about it a lot. As you read more about, you learn that the microbiome, now here's a geek word for you, modulates, modulates your brain function, modulates your cardiovascular fu function. What does modulate mean? It's a good Scrabble word. But what it means is you got your hands on the steering wheel. The microbiome has its hands on the steering wheel of how your brain works. What does that mean? Well, turn the steering wheel just a little bit. And where are you 200 yards down the road? You're in the ditch. So when you've got an abnormal microbiome, your brain, for every message from the brain going down to the gut, there are nine messages from the gut going up to the brain. That's the ratio, nine to one. The boss is in your gut telling your brain what hormones to produce. They're called neurotransmitters. How much of them to produce, what to do with those nerve hormones. It's all controlled by the microbiome in your gut. If there's only one system you're going to work on and you want longevity and vibrant health, it's your microbiome. And how do you have a healthy microbiome? You need diversity. It's the diversity of the microbiome that's most important. You can't take a pill of probiotics, the good bacteria, and expect that you're going to get a lot of diversity. It can help. The pills help. 
but you really have to look at your food consumption. So here's what we recommend to all of our patients. Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping for vegetables, always buy organic, but buy every type of root vegetable in the store. Get a couple of turnips and parsnips and radishes and rutabaga and uh, sweet potatoes and carrots, not too many white potatoes. And every day you have a different root vegetable because the root vegetables are loaded with what are called prebiotics. These are the foods that feed the good guys in your gut called probiotics. So you have to eat prebiotics to feed the probiotics in your gut. So eat a different root vegetable every day. Every day. Well, I don't know what to do with rutabaga. Well, neither do I. So what I do with it is I slice an onion, peel some garlic, put a little coconut oil in, a can, in the pan, saute the onions and garlic, throw the rutabaga in there, I dice it up, throw it in there, add a little peanut sauce or whatever flavor you want, it's really good. Well, what do you do with turnips? The same thing, slice some onion, dice up some garlic, dice up the uh, turnip and saute them, put a little peanut sauce or whatever you want. Well, what do I do with Jerusalem artichoke? The same thing, that's what I do. I don't care what you do to cook it, just get it down there. And when you do, you're feeding the good bacteria in your gut. So you have one root vegetable every day. Then you go to Google and you type in list of prebiotic foods, not probiotic, prebiotic foods. And you'll see bananas are a prebiotic. Artichokes are a prebiotic. And every day you have two prebiotics from the list that you print out and put on your refrigerator and one root vegetable every day. So you're feeding many different types of good bacteria in your gut. Then, Mrs. Patient, go to the health food store or Whole Foods, buy five different types of fermented vegetables. Sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, fermented beets, curry flavored, whatever you like. And every day you have one forkful of one of those fermented foods. Well, I don't like the taste of them. Throw them in the mashed potatoes then. It doesn't matter if you taste them or not, just get them down there. And when you include a forkful every day of the fermented foods, you increase the good guys by 10,000 times in your gut. So you're feeding it with the prebiotics, and then you're inoculating with the, with the good bacteria, the probiotics from fermented vegetables. That's a basic 101 that everybody has to do every day. What kind of supplements do you take or would you recommend for prevention? The first thing you have to do is choose your foods well. You can't eat sliders and then think taking a multiple vitamin is gonna make you healthy. You can't do it. You have to learn how to eat healthy food that you really like the taste of. Then after that, there's a couple that I think are really essential. Vitamin D, extra vitamin D is essential. It's hard to get enough vitamin D in your food. And vitamin D is, if there is one most important nutrient to take, it's vitamin D. Um, you want a blood test that says that your blood levels are between 50 and 75 NG per ml. That's nanograms per milliliter. That's the uh, measuring system in the US for all the uh, blood tests for vitamin D. You want to be between 50 and 75. Now the lab will say that 30 is okay. No, it's not. Just read the science and you'll see. But so vitamin D is good to take. A really good multiple vitamin is great to take. Not one a day, not cheap stuff that uses chemicals and petroleum derivatives. Uh, uh, there's more garbage in your body full of food colorings. You don't want any of that. And when you're dealing with health conditions to help to rebuild a strong, healthy microbiome, colostrum is really great. And the colostrum on our site is called GS Immuno Restore. The colostrum on our site is the exact same colostrum that three countries of Africa license as the treatment of choice for anyone diagnosed with HIV, AIDS, 
So colostrum is the treatment of choice because it strengthens the immune system in your gut so well. That's called GS Immuno Restore. Those are basics, GS Immuno Restore, a uh, multiple and vitamin D, but they're all secondary to having wholesome, organic uh, varieties of healthy foods. You, you really wanna choose your foods on a rainbow. It's called the rainbow diet, right? As many colors as you can. Blue, blueberries. One cup of blueberries a day reverses cognitive decline of up to 13 years within three years. You're thinking like you did three or 13 years ago, having a cup of blueberries every, organic, gotta be organic. Red, tomatoes. Men, when they have uh, spaghetti sauce or tomato sauce, cook down tomatoes, twice a week, they reduce their risk of prostate cancer by over 70%. Read the studies. You know, so you just want a variety of foods that you're eating. You don't eat the same five or six or 10 foods. You, you, just a variety. Whatever's growing right now is a good rule of thumb. You know, most cities have uh, 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 cooperatives where on a farm, you know, they're growing organic and people pay a couple hundred to four or $500 a year. And every week they get a box full of food. What's the food? Whatever we're harvesting that week, that's what you get. But it doesn't get any fresher than that, right? So you're getting variety all the time. The way your ancestors were meant to eat, a variety all the time. How about meats, grass-fed steak or organic chicken or, or you know, wild salmon? Do you, yeah. do you eat any, any meats or protein? Oh, you bet, you bet. Just had venison last night. Just made sure it was wild venison. Um, but yeah, um, um, there's been a lot of hullabaloo that red meat's not good for you, that it causes heart disease. And the science is really clear. Uh, Cleveland Clinic, which is the number one cardiovascular treatment center in the world now, they started publishing uh, four years ago that it's not the facts in red meat that are the problem. It's not the facts. It's the... Uh, uh, ingredients in the red meat. It's the carnitine in the red meat that is a problem only if you've got a bad bacteria in your gut. Those people that have bad bacteria in their gut, when they eat red meats, they produce something called TMAO, trimethylamine oxidase. Sorry, it's a geek word. But it's the most common, the, the highest accuracy marker that your pipes are plugging up. If you have TMAO levels that are elevated, much more accurate than cholesterol, much more accurate than homocysteine or C-reactive protein. TMAO is the most accurate marker your pipes are plugging up. And you only produce excessive amounts of TMAO if you've got bad bacteria in your gut taking the carnitine from meat and converting it into TMAO. So uh, everyone, when you check for cardiovascular risk, especially if there's a family history of cardiovascular risk, um, you wanna make sure to ask them to check your TMAO. Teresa Mary Andrew Oxford, TMAO. Just make sure to get that checked. If it's high, fix your gut. I got to ask you about kombucha. That's like the biggest craze now. Everybody's walking around with these kombucha, uh, kind of like a fake soda or a healthy soda. What do you think of that? Yeah, the problem with most commercial kombuchas are loaded with sugar. The idea of fermented beverages is a great one, a really great one. But the commercialization of all this, ooh, I really like the taste of that. Yeah, it's got more sugar than a Snickers bar. That's why and it puts weight on and it's not good for you at all. But the concept of fermented uh, beverages is ancient. Our ancestors used to do that and it's, it's actually really good for you, but you just can't drink the garbage stuff. Are there any brands that, that you can drink that you recommend that are commercially available in a Whole Foods? I'm not familiar with that. Okay, all right. Now, if somebody has uh, intestinal permeability, leaky gut, a bad microbiome, there's a test that you could follow these people, the wheat zoomer test. If you could explain about that and how, how doctors could use that to help their patients. You bet. And then uh, I'm sorry, I've got a time sequence here. Um, 
The Wheat Zoomer is an incredible test. We use it every day. We recommend to everyone all over the world. Uh, uh, for the first time in the history of laboratory medicine, everybody thinks when you get a lab test done, a blood test done, it's accurate. It's not. The accuracy of most lab tests is somewhere between 70 and 85%. That means it's right seven or eight out of 10 times, which means it's wrong two or three out of 10 times. Mayo Clinic published in 2016, they called it a new era in laboratory medicine. There's a new kid on the block in laboratory medicine. These guys are accurate 97 to 99% of the time, every single time. And it's because of this new technology called silicone chip technology. You know, um, um, there is no way 20 years ago that 25 years ago that I could have ever imagined that in 15 seconds, I can tell you the particulate matter, how much particulate matter is in the air in Bombay, India. But now I just go to my phone and I can pull this up in a moment. You can pull up an encyclopedia, anything you want to know, in five seconds to 15 seconds. I could never imagine that I'd hold something in my hand that would do that. At MIT, 25 years ago, it took a room 40 by 40, 15 feet high, floor to ceiling with computers to do what this phone does. We never could have imagined this. The same thing is true in laboratory medicine, but the laboratories don't want to use a new technology because it costs them hundreds of thousands of dollars to change over. And so they're resistant and it's very slow. The average is 17 years from when translational research, meaning research that's right on the money that changes the way we think from when it's first published before it's used in common practice, 17 years from when the first papers came out that cholesterol may have something to do with heart disease before the doc down the street was checking cholesterol, 17 years. And the same is true with this laboratory technology, but silicone chip technology is here. And the wheat zoomer is the most accurate test for a sensitivity to wheat or if you have the leaky gut. So for everyone who's watching this, I recommend you go to my website, thedr.com, Download the information about the wheat zoomer, take it to your doctor and say, please order this test for me. And if they won't order it, you can get ordered on my website or some other website if available, but get the test done because it's 97 to 99% accurate. The technical term is sensitivity and specificity. It's right on the money every time. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Tom O'Brien. Our listeners want to find out more about you. How could they find out about you? How could they buy your book? How could they buy Betrayal? Oh, thank you. Um, they're all at thedr.com, thedoctor.com. Just don't spell the word doctor out. It's thedr.com. And if you could give a little plug to your wife's website also. My wife's website? I thought she had a website. Uh, oh, oh, thank you. Uh, I've commandeered my wife. Um, about eight months ago, and she is now the boss of okay. the And it's, her signature on her email says COO, the doctor.com, and wife of the founder. Which okay. means don't mess with her. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, and I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to speaking with you again someday. Dr. Gill, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be with you, and good luck to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I like to bring extra, and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you. 